Okay, it's all yours, Wade. You should be able to share your screen. Perfect. Okay. Everyone see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, terrific. Okay, um, in keeping with my tradition of having two titles, um, it's a bug, 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 bug world is a, a blatant ripoff of the comedy classic, it's a mad, bad, mad, mad world from the 1960s and fanfare for the common bug is a ripoff of uh, Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man. I can't think of anything original of my own, so I just rip off other people's stuff. <clears throat> now, my goal here is to, um, is to get people interested and excited about some of the other insects that we see on our field trips and in our gardens. <clears throat> so we're gonna take a quick trip through the insect world, uh, hopefully, I've selected ones that are in your gardens. I know I've selected some species that I know we've seen on field trips. So hopefully this will bring back fond memories for people. So here's the title slide. And beginning with the um, clockwise from the upper left, we have wasps represented by this potter wasp. And just to the right of it on the same flower, there's a little picture winged fly. And then proceeding uh, clockwise, there's a Midas fly, which is New Jersey's largest fly coming in at about an inch. Bumblebee, this happens to be Bombus perplexus. A lot of these things don't have common names. Leaf hoppers being true bugs. And then of course, beetles. This is a longhorn flower beetle. All right, so let's uh, get into it. Now, when I was a kid, the only bugs I was, oops. The slide hasn't uh, come up again. We have, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> when I was a kid, the only bugs I was interested in were the ones that were in monster movies. So here are three, <laughs> three of my favorites. I haven't seen these in a while. Empire of the Ants, the Deadly Mantis, and the Wasp Woman. I just love some of the, um, the copy here. A beautiful woman by day and a lusting queen wasp at night. Boy, they don't make, they don't write stuff like that anymore. <clears throat> I don't know how many people remember those sorts of movies. And there's also one that appears on TV quite a bit these days called Them, which is about giant ants. So why do we care about insects? So I've got about three of these slides. We'll go through these pretty quickly. Uh, I want to draw your attention to um, down here under insects. Estimated 5 million species. Well, in point of fact, there's probably a good deal more than that. And then compare that at the very bottom, the total number of vertebrate species, a little over 80,000. That's probably a little low as well. So you can see from a species standpoint, insects are incredibly important. We'll move on to the next image as soon as it appears. And you've probably read these stories about the insect apocalypse. It's appeared now for the past several years in various publications. And they cite some studies done in various parts of the world indicating how um, there's been a decline, not just in species, but in biomass in several areas that have been studied. <clears throat> so that's not, uh, that's not too good if it's true when the studies have been done in so many places that there seems to be something going on. <clears throat> and so why is this important? And this will be the next image that pops up. <clears throat> Basically, a lot of the foods that we eat, particularly, rep uh, particularly um, vegetables and fruit are uh, pollinated by insects. So, um, that alone should uh, grab our attention. Also, insects are very important in uh, decomposing uh, matter, organic matter. The first one. Oh, yeah, and the first one. They are obviously food sources for various other uh, invertebrates and vertebrates. <clears throat> 
So many of you have um, recognized this. This is our house and um, one of our gardens that we maintain. All of the photo, well, almost all of the photographs you're going to see were taken here on our property. Uh, and just with the regular, by me, with just a regular point and shoot uh, Canon camera, you know, a little over 400 bucks or something. So you don't need any real fancy equipment to take decent photos that are identifiable. <clears throat> um, none of the insects that appear in this program were molested, abused, or inappropriately touched in any way. I call this my... Uh... No, go ahead. I call this my, TC, uh, my TCW rule, my Trump Cuomo Weinstein rule. <clears throat> Disclaimer. So, um, we're gonna be talking about insects other than butterflies. I know that seems strange for a butterfly club, but uh, here goes. Western honeybee. Now there's several species of honeybees. Uh, the one that we have here in this country is the Western honeybee. <clears throat> this was brought over um, around 1622 from um, Great Britain or the continent. So it's been here for 400 years and it is by far our most commercially valuable insect and they're very valuable in appearance. Some are very dark, some are very light, some are heavily striped, others not so much. <clears throat> but they pollinate just about everything from almonds to um, beans to whatever. Very, very important. And of course, you've probably read about how disease has run through a lot of the uh, colonies. <clears throat> and on the lower right, we have an example of a bumblebee on milkweed. I've tried to identify the plants that these insects are on as well, in addition to the insect itself. Next up, for those of you who have flower gardens, you've probably seen these tiny little green insects buzzing around, didn't know whether they were flies or bees. They're very metallic, very shiny looking. And there is a general classification of sweat bee. And there's various um, tribes, uh, genera within the sweat bees, but all of them are basically this greenish, bright green metallic coloration. And here you see them nectaring on short tooth mountain mint. We have a a colony where we have several colonies of mountain mints. The one in particular is very attractive to this species. And one time I estimated over 300 individual sweat bees uh, on one clump of this particular mountain mint. And on the lower right, you can see one on dandelion. Now, dandelion is not a native species, it's naturalized, but I do not get rid of it in our lawns. I like it. And the insects like it. It's one of the few things that's in bloom early in the spring. <clears throat> so we keep our, we keep our dandelions. A few other things that you may have seen on our field trips or <clears throat> in your garden. In the upper left, we have a, uh, an ichneumon wasp. There are many, many species of ichneumon wasps. This is in the genus Trogus. And this entire genus, all of the species are, paras are parasitoids of swallowtail caterpillars. So this particular one is on fennel. So we know that it is searching for black swallowtail caterpillars. The abdomen kind of reminds me of the Michelin man from those old commercials. And on the lower right, we have uh, a common wasp, the great golden digger wasp on swamp milkweed. You've probably seen this one, it's rather large and it's got that prominent orange and black abdomen, which is a warning coloration. Do not mess with me. Although when they're feeding on flowers, there's really no, uh, no danger. The only problem is when you get near their, near their nest. Uh, the great golden digger wasp lays eggs on uh, beetles, beetle larvae, under the ground, beetles like Japanese beetle, for example. So that's one reason why it's important to keep these native insects happy. Next up. 
Um, okay. okay, that's strange. For some reason, uh, the uh, next image didn't advance. So if you put out fruit, and many of us do for butterflies to attract butterflies like red spotted purples and angle wings and emperors, you probably attracted these two, the bold face hornet, which is not really a hornet, it's really a yellow jacket. And on the lower right, my favorite, the Eastern yellow jacket. We've had many encounters, usually unpleasant, but um, we have uh, we have colonies uh, in our yard all the time. And as long as you don't mess with the nest, you're a okay. Now we're going to get into the uh, flies. Many, many, many species of flies. Next to the beetles, it is the most diverse group. And we're finding more and more fly species all the time. On the upper left, we have a tachinid fly. These things are really pretty homely. I mean, let's face it. It's got these spiky hairs. It's got this punk look to it, the big eyes. And this is also on a patch of mountain mint, as you can see. All, almost all flies are, are parasitoids. So they lay their eggs on a host and eventually the host dies. On the lower right here, we have golden back snipe fly. Now I know we've seen these on our field trips. They're denizens of, of uh, wood edges, uh, particularly low moist spots. And in this particular case, we can identify, we can sex them. Uh, in many species of flies, the males, and this is the one that's pointing downward in this image, the eyes are very close together, touching or almost touching, whereas in the female, the eyes are usually widely separated. That's a pretty neat, uh, pretty attractive little fly. And next up, we have flower or hoverflies. We call them flower flies in North America. Uh, across the pond, they call them hoverflies. And now this one on the upper left on the oxide daisy is one of the tinier ones checking it at about a quarter of an inch. You can see those extremely large eyes, which are characteristic of flies. The very, very small antennae, also characteristic of flies. And this particular one is one of the smaller species, check, uh, only one quarter of an inch. On the lower right, we have one of the more robust ones, one of the drone flies on woodland sunflower. <clears throat> I know we've seen various species of flower flies on our field trips. And next up, uh, one more fly. We've got the thick headed fly, which we see quite a bit of on our mountain mints, and you probably do as well. <clears throat> it's not called thick-headed fly because it's stupid, although it might be, but it's because it has a very large noggin, very big head, thick-headed fly. And you'll see just to the left of the H in the word haltier, you will see the haltier itself. That's that little spatulate-shaped pale thing where the cursor is. And in flies, there's only one pair of true wings. The second pair has been modified over the years and evolved over the years, millions and millions of years to be this structure here, which supposedly acts like a gyroscope, which aids in the balance of the flies, probably necessary for flies because they do so much hovering. <clears throat> and then on the lower right, is it a fly, is it a wasp, or is it a scorpion? Well, no, it's actually the scorpion fly. Now we know right away that this is not a true fly uh, in the order Diptera, because just looking at the name itself, scorpion fly, it all, it's all one word. If it were a true fly, fly would appear as a separate word as in thick headed fly. So butterfly, Dragonfly, we know these are true flies, but they are properly only shown as one word. Also, note how long the antennae are. 
You're never going to see a fly with antennae, a true fly with antennae that long, small eyes, and it's got a very long beak, which is also not characteristic of flies. And you can see here the tail or the end of the abdomen is curled up. And that's where it gets the name scorpion fly. <clears throat> We've seen these on our field trips. Now we get to the uh, beetles. This is by far and away, so far, the most abundant, the most species diverse group of uh, insects. In fact, it has been said, and I've seen it in print, that one out of every five multicellular organisms, including plants, is a beetle. That's an amazing figure. <clears throat> now here we have in the upper left a cockleburr weevil. Weevils are by far the most abundant group uh, within the beetles. <clears throat> hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of species of weevils, probably. In this case here, I just, I was very lucky to catch this beetle just as it was taking off. So it, it shows these, what are really modified forewings here that are now called, that are called elytra. So these are hardened protective coverings that protect the soft body parts, especially the abdomen of the beetle. And when the beetle gets overly threatened, and wants to take off, it flicks up these elytra, they get locked into place, and then the flight wings come out. You can see that this is that shiny membranous structure right in here where my cursor is, very thin, translucent or transparent, and those are the wings that power the flight. It's an amazing thing, and all of this happens in, uh, in less than a second. <clears throat> All weevils have snouts of some kind or another, and they all have these elbowed antennae. So this reminds me when you were a kid, you would attach things to your head that would have like an eyeball at the end and you'd say, take me to your leader, that kind of thing. So that's typical of weevils. I think weevils are pretty cool. You, there's like a weevil for almost every plant there is. It's incredible, the species diversity of weevils. The one that we know of is the boll weevil. That's the one that's very common that attacked cotton crops <clears throat> many years ago and still does. Now I call beetles nature's transformers because in the case of this cockleburr weevil, <clears throat> those elytra and the pronotum shield here where my cursor is just behind the head, <clears throat> they're, they're very solid protective coverings. So they're almost like a tank on legs but they can immediately transform into a uh, into an airplane. So that's that's the original transformers. Kids these days play with transformers, but it's nothing new. The Beatles invented it many years ago. And then multicolored Asian lady beetles. These are now our most common uh, lady beetles. They feed on, uh, like all lady beetles, on aphids and some other insects. And these were introduced actually to feed on aphids, but now they've gone crazy and um, they're very common and at the expense of some of our native species, which are declining. A couple of other species that we've seen on our field trips, <clears throat> we have Japanese beetles on red clover. Japanese beetles are not native and neither is red clover. Red clover is a naturalized plant. I happen to like it. It attracts a lot of insects, including a lot of native species of insects. And you can always identify Japanese beetles even from above because of the white hairs along the edge there. It's very, very distinctive. Somewhat similar, but a native species is the dog bang beetle. I've only ever seen them feeding on dog beans, the dog bangs. They've got this marvelous uh, reflective uh, elytra and it is one of the few insects that's ever appeared on a U.S. postage stamp. Really a pretty neat uh, beetle. And if you check dog veins, uh, you're likely to find some. A few more beetles coming up. Things that you've probably seen in your garden. We've certainly seen them on field trips, the Pennsylvania leatherwing. 
is a uh, common soldier beetle. It's kind of related to our fireflies. <clears throat> Another characteristic of beetles that you can see here is that the elytra meet right down the middle. So there's no overlap, which you find in other insects. So there's the two elytra. This is the pronotum shield right here with this black spot. And here is the head. And here we have a male uh, has mated, probably already mated with the female, and he's simply protecting his investment. That's a common practice in the beetles. And on the lower right, I know we've seen locust borer beetles. They come out in midsummer uh, when a lot of the composite flowers are out. And this one is like so many other insects, colored yellow and black, a warning coloration. Uh, like a yellow jacket or something. So it's an indication to stay away from me, although it is in fact harmless. It's pretty good sized, about one inch. And you can see here, this is a very good example of segmented antennae. You can see how the antennae are composed of many different segments. And next up are some of uh, two somewhat larger species. We have in the upper left, the green June beetle or June bug, as a lot of people call it. And here you can see these are different antennae. These are like fan-shaped antennae. I think it's called the belliformi antennae. And in the right, we have a great leaf beetle, beetle. Again, look at the elytra, how they meet evenly, the pronotum shield, the head, the antennae. And on the bottom, a red melt, a red milkweed beetle. You've probably seen these. A lot of the insects that are dependent on milkweed, that use milkweed as host plants, have the same color as the monarch butterfly, red and black. They ingest the same alkaloids that the uh, monarch caterpillars do. <clears throat> and finally, the end of the beetles are the decomposers. Most decomposition in our woods and fields takes place by <clears throat> bacteria and fungi. But the insects play an important role as well. So in the upper left, we have pleasing fungus beetles. I'm not quite sure why they're called pleasing, but I'm always pleased to see them. They're very colorful, very active. And when you um, tap on a, um, a tree fungus, oftentimes you can get them kind of coming out and that's what happened here in this particular case. <clears throat> uh, on the right, carrion beetle with mites. Now I've been photographing carrion beetles at my moth lights for 20 years. And I've attracted many, many carrion beetles. And I can't think of a time when I saw one that did not have mites on it. Now these are phoretic mites, which is to say, they don't have any physiological relationship to the beetle. Uh, the beetle is simply providing transportation like an Uber. So the mites climb on board. The carrion beetle goes to carrion someplace. And the beetles then, or the mites, which are not insects, they're really arachnids. <clears throat> they, cl they, um, they, they climb off and they start eating the eggs and very recently hatched uh, larvae of beetle competitors. So they're eating fly eggs and the eggs and young larvae of other competitors of the beetle. So the beetle gets something out of this because the young beetles now have less competition. The larval beetles have less competition at the carrion and the mites get a free ride to the carrion. So it's a nice symbiotic relationship. They both benefit for it. And like I say, it's a common thing to see these mites. And down here we have a dung beetle, of course, doing its thing. <clears throat> now, if I, um, when I pass on and I come back as something else, I hope it's not a dung beetle. I don't wanna come back as a dung beetle. Although in a world ruled by dung beetles, it might not be a bad thing. So you've probably all seen those things. Now the next one, as we march through the insects, 
The next image is of some tree bugs, which are the only insects that we can refer to as bugs without getting an entomologist too uh, excited. So true bugs are ones with sucking mouth parts and they range anywhere from aphids, the size of tiny little aphids, to things as large as cicadas. Those are all sucking insects. The oleander aphids, no doubt, you gardeners have seen <clears throat> primarily on milkweeds, but on other plants as well. Here you see an ant tending the aphids. The aphids produce a, uh, a sweet substance that the ants imbibe, and the ants in turn protect the aphids from things like um, lady beetle larvae. <clears throat> And on the lower left, we have an annual cicada. I found this uh, emerging actually on my foundation when I was out looking at moths one evening a year or two ago. You can see the dark eyes. And on the right, we have a just emerged adult periodical cicada with the red eyes. I call this my grouch, the, the, the groucho mark phase <clears throat> for obvious reasons. Although I never found cicadas particularly funny. Okay, continuing with some true bugs, and we've seen these on our field trips, are some milkweed bugs, small milkweed bug nymphs. You must have seen these uh, piles of the nymphs on the old milkweed pods. They all sort of cram together. Very, very common. And, the red and, black. and again, the red and black coloration. And on the, the large milkweed bug, which in my experience is much less common, also the same color combination. This one here is on a common milkweed. And then we get to the probably the most numerous group of true bugs, and those are the various hoppers. We've got leaf hoppers are incredibly diverse. I believe that there's well over 2,000 species in uh, North America. These happen to be the candy striped leaf hoppers, which are really pretty cool. You can always tell leaf hoppers from the other hoppers because of the spines on the tibia here, which you can see. And they are purported to be able to jump 20 times their body length. Plant hoppers, uh, less common, but nonetheless frequently seen. And maybe my favorite group are these tree hoppers, particularly the ones with the big humps, which are known as buffalo tree hoppers. Really pretty cool. All of these are attracted to lights at night. And it's really pretty interesting looking at all of the different species. And whether we know it or not, we have a lot of garden dramas, what we call garden dramas taking place every minute of every day, every minute of every night that take place in our garden and elsewhere. So here we have an encounter on the left between an assassin bug with an ambush bug. Both of these are predators, mainly of other insects. And we can sort of piece together what happened here. So the ambush bug, which is the smaller one on the bottom, is just like its name indicates, a wait and see predator. It just sits around and waits for something to come within range for those big Popeye forearms to grab right here. The assassin bug, on the other hand, is also a sit and wait predator, but it also stalks prey. So what's happened here is, to put it in film noir terms, terms, the assassin bug got the drop on the ambush bug and it impaled it right where the chink in its armor, right between the head and the body. And that's where they always go for it. Now this structure here is called the rostrum. And it's what they use like a switchblade knife. When it's not in use, it folds back rather neatly right underneath the chin and throat. <clears throat> but it can, it can unfold it very quickly, just like a switchblade. And it goes right for that particular weak spot. 
these ambush bugs, don't be fooled by their small size. They're very powerful. I've seen them take things as large as tiger swallowtails. And here on the lower right, it's an assassin bug nymph. There's the rostrum. And in this case, the prey is a beetle, which is armored. But again, there's that chink in the armor right between the elytra, which cover the abdomen, and the pronotum, the pronotum shield. <clears throat> Uh, the next pair, no doubt you've seen um, praying mantises with uh, various prey items, including monarchs. So what this child, there's four species of mantids in New Jersey now. The common one and the largest one is the Chinese mantis. And we've seen them frequently capture monarchs and they'll, they'll nip off the wings and then they'll proceed to eat the monarch starting at the head and then proceeding down from there. One that you've probably not seen, however, though, is the thread-legged bug. And this is something that's attractive to uh, lights at night. This thing is only about an inch and a half long in terms of the body. And the legs are exceedingly thin, hence the name. And it's a very hard thing to see, uh, really, when you, even when you're close to it. Now here, this one has uh, captured um, one of the moths here at my right. It's more common than you think, but it's, it's nocturnal. And unless you have lights out, you're probably never going to see it. Next up is a group that is uh, mainly tropical. Uh, walking sticks, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of tropical species, but in New Jersey, we only have one, the Northern walking stick. This is a female, they're larger than the males. And I'm always, I'm always, I always feel lucky to see a walking stick because they're so hard to find and they're really cool looking things. So here we have two pairs of legs here and we have a pair of legs going this way, extending up past the head. And then this smaller thing here is the one of the antennae. Very slow moving. These are strictly vegetarian. And sometimes they occur in big outbreaks where there's hundreds or thousands of them. I've never seen that, but. Now we move on to the singing insects, a particularly favorite group of mine, the orthopods. So these are the crickets, the grasshoppers, the katydids of the world. And although there's only one true katydid, which we'll get to in a minute, there are lots of bush katydids, lots of species of bush katydids. And they all make their own species specific vocalizations. And if you have good hearing like Sharon has, you can actually identify the species simply by its vocalizations, just like just as you do for birds. I want to draw your attention to the very long antennae here, which are so long, they're actually going off the image here on this katydid. And on the lower right, we have treetop bush katydid. There are lots of these species of bush katydids. Contrast that with the next pair of images, which are grasshoppers. Notice that right away, that the antennae are much shorter and thicker in grasshoppers. And there's two species that we see around my yard frequently. Uh, the differential grasshopper, distinguished by this herringbone pattern on the leg, and the red-legged grasshopper because of the red-colored uh, tibia there. Again, short, rather stout antennae compared to katydids. Lots of species of grasshoppers. In fact, there is a field guide devoted just to grasshoppers. Now a quick trip to one of my favorite groups, as you know, the moths. We have many diurnal species and we see these in our gardens routinely. Uh, the clear wing moths ought to be out soon. There are three species, but only two of which are commonly seen, the hummingbird clear wing, and of course the snowberry clear wing, which looks a lot like a bumblebee. Uh, we've seen many of these on our field trips. 
The bottom one here is one that's less often seen, but nonetheless a common inhabitant of our gardens beginning in summer and then continuing into the fall, the yellow colored skate moth. <clears throat> so I've written, I've showed you the host, written down the host plants here. <clears throat> Oftentimes they're varied. Uh, a lot of these caterpillars will feed on a wide variety of things. It's unbelievable. You look through the you look through the field guides and it'll say something like uh, feeds on uh, oaks and dandelions, you know, and everything in between. <clears throat> I like this image of the of the yellow colored skate moth because you can see the bright red, almost blood colored tongue or proboscis here. <clears throat> the orange collar, hence the name. And it's got a very um, iridescent metallic blue abdomen. And we can't forget that shrubs also, and trees for that matter, many of them require pollination by, so here are four examples. In the upper left, we have maple leaf viburnum, one of our really truly great native uh, woodland shrubs, upland woodland shrubs. And here you may not be able to see it, I'm circling it with my with my cursor, this is one of the many species of longhorn flower beetles. And you see it's been on this flower for a while. It's completely dusted with pollen, making it very hard to see. <clears throat> to the right of that, a flower fly, one of the many species of flower flies, uh, taking nectar or pollen from um, a native honeysuckle. <clears throat> now, for those of you who go to Sunrise Mountain, uh, you can see this native honeysuckle growing in profusion between the Sunrise Mountain parking lot and the shelter. So if you go there toward the second half of June and into July, you can see that in bloom. The lower left is the drone fly on hawthorn blooms. Hawthorn's a shrub that's declining and we seldom see it in any uh, numbers anymore. And on the lower right, this is an image from um, Jenny Jump State Forest uh, of a variety of beetles on a pasture rose bloom. So here we have some long neck, some um, uh, longhorn flower beetles, two different species here and here. And then all of these little guys are what are called tumbling flower beetles, flower as in the plant flower. And they're called tumbling because when they're disturbed, they have a tendency to sort of go limp and go tumbling off of the flower. I'm sure it's a way of escaping uh, predation. And you'll attract things that don't uh, nectar. So um, even without a water feature in or near your property, you'll probably attract uh, some dragonflies. <clears throat> Uh, be, they just require things to perch on. Uh, so here's a 12 spotted skimmer on a blue flag iris, which is just about to open. And on the lower right, we have a double striped bluet on one of our little blue stem grasses. <clears throat> We've had over 30 species in our yard in Sussex County. And in fact, Sussex County has recorded more species of odonates uh, than any other county in the entire country possibly because there's been a lot of work done in Sussex County, but we do have a lot of different habitats. But at night is when we really start seeing some of the real weirdos and oddballs come out. So if you go out in your gardens at night <clears throat> with flashlight and play the light around your blooms, uh, you're bound to see stuff. So this is stuff that I've seen just in my flashlight a galium sphinx on Brazilian verbena, which is one of our favorite uh, annuals. And one of those other bush katydids. This is a fork-tailed bush katydid. It's a female. You can see that scimitar-shaped ovipositor right there that it uses to slice open vegetation stems and in which it lays eggs. But the best way to see them is to turn on some lights because then the insects come to you. 
And boy, do they come. Such a tremendous variety. So if you live in an area where there's some native vegetation, some trees and shrubs, uh, you'll attract a wide variety of insects. This is probably taken uh, based upon the species I see here, probably in June or July. And there's a lot of moths. There's a lot of uh, dobson flies. That's these things here, which I greatly dislike. If I don't come back as a... Uh, as a beetle, I certainly don't want to come back as a dobson fly either. Um, and a lot of these other things are moths, basically, and a lot of other insects as well. It's amazing the variety of stuff you attract at night to lights. And I'll just show you quickly an example of a few of them. <clears throat> so here we have, when the image pops up, we have a pair of promethea moths. This is one of the giant silk moth species. So what happened here is the one on the right, which is the female, was attracted to the light and she perched and clung to the side of the house. All the while, apparently, emitting pheromones, which are just microscopic chemicals that are really sex attractants. And that those pheromones waft downstream on the air current and hopefully get detected by a male who is able to pick up these pheromones by this marvelous intricate antennae. And then it follows the pheromone trail back to the source, which was of course the female. So that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, a lot of these giant silk moths are really declining due to various reasons. A few more examples of these magnificent giant silk moths, which I'm sure that you could attract as well those of you who live in relatively dark areas. So here's a polyphemus moth. But I like this one because it shows the hind wings as uh, resembling an owl. So here we have uh, the two eyes, which are basically just eye spots. They're not eyes, of course. Here is what passes for the bill. And then you've got the feathers, or in this case, modified hairs growing along the edge of the bill, and here's the facial disc. So it looks like an owl, and it's supposed to startle predators. And the nice thing about these silk moths is that uh, we've come to an understanding and that the money shot is really the hind wing shot. So you wanna be able to get a shot showing the hind wing as well as the forewing. And these silk moths, you can gently spread those forewings just with the back of your fingers, like using the, your fingernails, don't grab the wing, but just use your fingernail to gently spread those wings apart. And they will stay that way and allow you to get as many photographs as you want. Unlike those lousy stinking sphinx moths, which are not nearly as um, cooperative. This is a female, you can see the small, um, not very detailed intricate antennae. Um, my dog uh, Zuzu is barking like crazy. Maybe there's a bear outside. I haven't gotten the feeders in yet. Nothing that exciting. Now we have uh, a Cecropia moth. This is our largest silk moth, about six inches across from wingtip to wingtip. Marvelous species. Again, a female, rather limited antennae here. And a lot of these um, will. Um, uh, the uh, caterpillars will spin their cocoons on shrubs like spice bush, for example. And some of them, the, the attachment to the shrub is not very good. And a lot of the cocoons fall down to the ground, which is fine. They can pupate down there as well. <clears throat> Others um, just spin their cocoons actually in the leaf litter on the ground. Io moth. Well, when you see an Io moth, you, you don't forget it. This is another one of those spectacular moths. It's about to come up here. I don't know what's taking so long on this one. Here we go. This is a male. And this is one of the smaller silk, uh, sphinx moths, is, uh, silk moths. It's about two and a half to three inches across the wings there. But here again, eye spots and uh, really a spectacular spectacular insects, still reasonably common. The next two are common. In fact, I think they're actually increasing. The wonderful imperial moth, 
the host for various deciduous species. And the pattern here is so intricate on these uh, imperial moths that you can actually identify individuals. And I often get 20, 25, 30 individuals in a year. Um, they ought to be emerging in June, the adults. And of course, we've all seen Luna moths, probably the most spectacular North American insect. It really is a marvelous thing to see. It has two broods. The first brood just came out. I got my first Luna moth two nights ago. And if all goes well, there'll be another brood in July. <clears throat> the tails uh, usually are more twisted in males than in females. And that twisted tail, apparently, it's been shown scientifically <clears throat> to interfere with the echolocation capabilities of bats. So um, that's perhaps how that tail evolved over the years. Next up are another group of moths, the rosy maple moth. I'm sure you've seen these. These are very, very common. The host plants are maple and oak, which are obviously very common trees. They're very garish, aren't they? Pink and yellow. Sometimes I get dozens of these a night uh, at my light. I'm sure you've seen those. And the Sphinx moths are like the um, Formula 500 race cars of the moth world. Very, very powerful flower flyers. They're medium to large size and often mistaken for hummingbirds because they are so large, fast flying, and they go from flower to flower. Another group are the uh, underwing moths. This is uh, an example here, the clouded underwing. I've attracted about 45 species of underwings to my light, underwing moths. And um, you need to look at the hindwing. The hindwing is the money shot. And you really need the hindwing to identify many of the species. Some are black and orange, some are black and red, some are black and pink, some are black and white and the width of the bands vary as well. So you need, really need to look at the hind wing. They have all kinds of interesting names. Linnaeus named all of these, the great Swedish naturalist, um, which he identified from specimens. And he gave them all kinds of strange names. So one of the themes of the underwing moths are like uh, the mother underwing, the um, little nymph, the once married, underwing, the, um, the girlfriend underwing, the old wife underwing. Just as a clue, do not let the girl, girlfriend underwing show up the same time as the old wife underwing. And then there's the disconsolate group too. Uh, then there's the, the ones that are black and white are named after um, like tearful underwing, the inconsolable underwing, the forsaken underwing, marvelous names. And on the lower right here, we have another neat one, the giant leopard moth. This has spots, hence the name, rather large moth. And when it's fresh, it is a rather spectacular moth. A couple more coming up here. The upper left is the yellow veined geometer moth. Isn't that a cool looking moth? I love seeing these things. Unfortunately, I only get one or two a year. Uh, the hosts are viburnums. And uh, the one on the lower right, I'm particularly proud of. This is a new species for me that showed up at the light uh, just a week or two ago. The green dusted zally. As far as I know, it's the first record for North Jersey. Its host is oaks, but this was just a spectacular looking moth. The Isabella tiger moth, which is up next, I'm sure you've all seen, but not as an adult. Here it is. It's one of many species of tiger moths, but I'll bet dollars to donuts, you've never seen an adult, but you've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the caterpillars because the caterpillar is in fact the the woolly bear caterpillar. 
I'm always breaking for woolly bear caterpillars or doing the swerves to go around them. Um, a lot of people are very surprised uh, when they see the adult form of that. And now just a few caterpillars, which are best seen at night usually, because during the day they usually remain hidden from um, predators like birds, for example. So here we have two examples that I photographed at night in my yard, uh, the spiny oak slug moth and the saddleback caterpillar moth. And uh, any caterpillar that's got hairs, whether they're stiff hairs or whether they look like they're, like they could be petted, um, don't touch them because um, you could be very sensitive to, um, to those hairs. In fact, the, with the flannel moths, uh, you could actually be rushed to the hospital in some cases. So don't touch things that have caterpillars that have hairs. Now, two more that are also out and about at night that I photographed in my yard at night. Uh, the upper left is one of the uh, many species of sphinx moths, the Pandora sphinx moth. A lot of moths feed on grape and Virginia creeper. When I say a lot of moths, I mean they're caterpillars. <clears throat> this comes in a brown phase and a green phase. I just want you to note these four, what we call prolegs, abdominal prolegs. This is the anal proleg. And the real legs are just scrunched up here on this particular individual. On the lower right, we have the red humped caterpillar moth. Now in the early stages, which we call instars of these caterpillars, they're gregarious. That's true of a lot of butterfly caterpillars as well as moth caterpillars. So you might see dozens and dozens all together on the underside of a leaf. After the third instar, they go their own separate ways, and you see them as individuals for the most part. Now, a little quiz here. Are this, does this, uh, these two slides, do these represent caterpillars? They look like caterpillars, but in point of fact, they are not. These are actually sawflies, which are primitive wasps, and you can tell them from caterpillars by counting the number of these prolegs. In the previous slide, we counted four abdominal prolegs, which is pretty consistent among butterflies and moths. Well, here you can see there's way more than four along here before you get to the true legs. So if it's got five or more, there are sawflies. Now, if you have a shrub in your yard that's getting all eaten up, I mean, real fast, a lot of the leaves are disappearing check the undersides of the leaves, my bet is, is that it's sawfly larvae. And they can really do a number because sometimes you find hundreds of them. Uh, down here is a, is a dogwood that was uh, given to us by uh, Gary Annabelle. And um, it's grown great. It's really grown great, but we have to watch it because um, all of a sudden, within just a day or two, if you don't pay attention to it, a lot of the leaves start to look like this or worse. Back to the orthopterans for just a minute before we uh, end up here. There's only one species of true katydid around here, and that's the common katydid. This is the one that goes katydid, Katie didn't. And check out the antennae on this one. Here we go from the head all the way up here, goes off the image, comes back again, past the palps of the mouth, and ends up around here someplace by the second, by the middle pair of legs. Unbelievable. <clears throat> this, uh, the, lead, the wings look like leaves, and these are very much arboreal. So the only time you see them down on or near the ground is when they've been blown out of a tree by strong winds or heavy rain or something. And this is how I photograph this particular individual. Some other ones that you're probably not familiar with on this next slide are the, the red-headed bush cricket. There are many species of bush crickets. It's also known as the handsome trig, which is a name I particularly like. 
has a very loud trill. It has a, um, Sharon can hear it. It's got a very loud trill for such a tiny little insect, which is, you know, like less than a half an inch. And on the lower right, we have one of the many species of tree crickets. Who knew that there were things called tree crickets? I didn't know before I got heavily into insects. But they're the things you hear in the background in the trees, primarily. So the katydids are like the soloists that get all of the attention. Uh, the background music, the chorus, made up of various species of tree crickets. This happens to be the two-spotted tree cricket. And apparently Nathaniel Hawthorne was rather taken with the sound of tree crickets because he came up with this marvelous evocative kind of saying, if moonlight could make noise, it would sound like this. And he was referring to tree crickets, which I think is really pretty cool. So what can you do? So this is our backyard. This is not what it looks like now, but um, a lot of, if you can, if you don't have a lot of room, you can pot plants and keep them on the ground. You can hang them. You can have a trellis, uh, put in a water feature. And then in the back here, milkweeds got started somehow. We didn't plant them. Milkweeds got started. We just let go. And boy, did it go. And now this patch is pretty much gone, but it's migrated out toward the sassafras tree and beyond. And we just let the milkweeds go. It's a great benefit to our yard. The other thing that you can do is let some of your lawn go. Now, just about everything you see in this photograph when we bought the house was lawn. It was lawn up to the garage. It was lawn back here in this garden, lawn over here where the shed was, and it was lawn here in the foreground. So we just let the foreground go pretty much and let it grow up and mostly, luckily for us, native species like little blue stem grass. So when you do that, some things happen. Good things happen. So you get some interesting plants growing. Now, this next image shows a Queen Anne's lace in bloom. Now, Queen Anne's lace is not a native species. It's uh, naturalized. For some reason, this image is not coming up. I don't know why. Oh, here we go. So here's a, here's a Queen Anne's lace. Now there are 11 insects on here. At the very bottom, at the six o'clock position is a Pennsylvania leatherwing beetle. And as we go counterclockwise, there's a couple of flies here. And there's a different species of fly in the center. Up here in the upper right is the wasp. There's an ant, there's another wasp. This beetle here is a flower scarab beetle. Sometimes I get hundreds of these at my moth lights. And over here, another ant. So even though Queen Anne's lace is not a native species, I keep it. It's very, very attractive to insects. And it very seldom forms a real dominant. Every now and then it does. It also happens to be the host plant for our state butterfly, the black swallowtail, or at least one of the host plants. It's in the carrot family. And something else that grew up in the yard was tower mustard. Tower mustard is a native species that appeared uh, to our great delight. And it's a nectar plant for various things, including this American copper butterfly. But it's also the host plant for another terrific species of butterflies. So one year we found this caterpillar. And then later on, we found the chrysalis, which looks like a thorn. And then later on, this is what emerged, was this marvelous falcate orange tip butterfly. Now, if that was all lawn, if we just left it all as lawn, none of what you just saw would have, would have transpired. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. Sharon and I are lucky in that we do live in the country and we don't have um, any close neighbors. So nobody gets excited about our not mowing or not keeping things as you would if you lived in a suburban area, particularly in a place where there was a, um, a um, homeowners association. And one last thing that you can do 
is uh, just keep up the keep the native species, no matter how how ugly they are. So here we have this is on our property. There's a red oak. There's a lot of oaks. So if you've read Doug Callamy's latest book about oaks, you'll know that oaks are host to more species of insects than any other genus of plants. Um, but it's important to keep other trees as well. So here in the foreground, we have this scraggly looking thing here, which in 20 years hasn't grown much. These are the leaves up here on the left. This is a black cherry sapling. Although, and although cherries do not host as many uh, groups of insects or species of insects as oaks do, nonetheless, they do host a lot of species. In fact, some of the photographs of caterpillars that I showed you were taken on this little scraggly black cherry. And tiger swallowtail cat. And tiger swallowtail caterpillars. And it's also the host plant for coral hair streak, among other things. So most homeowners would have chopped this down because it uh, doesn't look like much. But if you keep these things, then you'll increase your, your diversity of insects and you'll be doing a good thing. Here are some of the sources that I've used. Many of you have these sources of information. There are um, many, many, many field guides these days to just about any group of insects. <clears throat> uh, here's the camera, which is, like I said, just a point and shoot Canon SX50 and then later on an SX70 camera, about 450 bucks. A close up lens, which I really don't use much anymore. And of course, you're familiar with the close focusing uh, uh, Pentax binoculars. There's also online sources like Bug Guide, the Moth Photographers Group, iNaturalist, and Butterflies and Moths in North America, Bamona, just to name a few. Now, for those of you who were in attendance at the last, at April's program, which was Members Night, you'll remember that I showed three species of quiz insects. And I um, asked people if they were so inclined to take pictures of them on their screen and work out their identifications and that we would go over them in this show. <clears throat> I don't know how many did. I know Mike Nolan did and I gave Mike a passing grade. So um, uh, we can um, open this up to discussion. Donna, if you want to unmute folks. Oh, everyone can unmute themselves. I didn't mute them. So oh, if, they, okay. if you have a comment or question of Wade, please feel free to unmute at this point. Right. So how many people guessed that this was a beetle? Well, if you did, you were right. This is called a net vein beetle. There are three species that I know of. So here you have again, why is this a beetle? Well, here you have the, two, the wings, which in beetles are elytra, meeting right flush, right down the middle, characteristic of beetles. Also, these very long, very obvious segmented antennae, also characteristic of many species of beetles. Now, there are things that look like this. There's a moth that looks like this, but it's not going to have these evenly this, uh, these elytra that meet down the middle, and it's also not going to have segmented antennae. So this is a net, one of the net veined beetles, and we have, believe it or not, seen these on one or more of our field trips. Oh, the Blue Mountain Lakes parking lot, China tells me we saw a net veined beetle. Okay, so here's quiz insect number two. Now, for those of you who guessed that this was a wasp, you are wrong. You are dead wrong. This is not a wasp. This is a moth. But it has the coloration sort of of a wasp. Typically, you find in wasps an orange and black colored abdomen. But wasps normally have a very thin waist. Yeah. You refer to people as wasp wasted. That means they have a very thin waist. And here you have antennae, which are not segmented. 
it's hard to see in this photograph, but it's called filiform antennae without individual segments. So this is a peach tree borer moth, the greater or larger peach tree borer moth. This was taken in our yard and also the long proboscis here going down into this whatever. And lastly, and perhaps the most difficult uh, is this. This is the last image, uh, the last quiz image. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like a caterpillar. And most people would call it a caterpillar. But mm -hmm. using the knowledge that you've just learned, and if you count the number of these abdominal prolegs, you can see that there's way, way more than four. So things that look like caterpillars, but have more than four prolegs are sawflies. And this is a particular species called the elm sawfly, the larvae of the elm sawfly. This was taken at White Lake, <clears throat> which many people have been to. It's got a black mid dorsal stripe, which is a characteristic of these elm sawflies. And here it is chomping away on what appears to be a willow, which we can tell by these buds here, which are flush right up against the stem and are composed basically of just one um, scale. <clears throat> so how, I don't know how many people took the quiz challenge um, and how many of you uh, managed to score one, two or three correct. Uh, you can chime in uh, when we're done. And we are done right now with this photograph of this imperial moth uh, head on shot, which I'd like to take sometimes. To me, this looks like a sheep. And this would probably be a male with the intricate antennae here of the uh, male imperial moth. So we're gonna leave it there. If anybody has any questions or would like to discuss the quiz uh, insects, uh, this is your chance. Don't all chime in at once. I want to I say a question. Did a great job. Thanks. Yeah. Wade? Uh, I'm sorry. Did uh, somebody said they had a question? Yes, Caroline. I have a question. Yes. You showed, you showed a picture of dragonflies. And I was wondering, what do they eat if they don't mm -hmm. nectar? Oh, the dragonflies? Yes. Uh, yes, they, they eat other insects, primarily. Oh. Okay, um, thank you. Just uh, from, from a strictly butterfly uh, standpoint, I've seen uh, something called the dragon hunter yeah. um, mm -hmm. kill and eat a great spangled fritillary. Yeah. And, wow. um, but mm -hmm. they eat just about anything that they can get a hold of. Anywhere from um, you know, mosquitoes, tiny little insects, flying insects, to something as large as a monarch or a great spangled fritillary. So if you have a lot of native plants in your, in your garden and on your property, you'll attract these dragonflies because they are predators looking for other insects. If you, if you simply have a mowed lawn, you're not gonna be attracting much of anything. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Wade, I do have a question. This is Lee. You showed yes, um, a couple of bugs on milkweed. And I always thought that the orange ones that had those what looked like little black wings were just the one of the instars of the larger milkweed bug. But you're saying it's a completely different insect? Yeah, those. Yeah, the ones I showed you were of the small milkweed bug. Yep. The, they were. They were the nymphs. Okay, so yeah. they were different. Yeah. Now, um, I also know that there's yeah. a milkweed bug and a milkweed beetle. Right. Um, did you show a picture of a milkweed beetle? No, I didn't. Okay. No. So the beetle I mean, I does, have... I think I have uh, an image of one. It looks more like what... Um, a ladybug would have been, for instance. Yes, exactly. Black exactly. and red, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, the milk, 
The milkweed beetle looks like a very large version of a lady beetle. Yeah. Okay. Thank and, you. you no, know, it's got that domed appearance, and it's yes. and it's red and black. You know, mm -hmm. I don't find milkweed beetles as common mm -hmm. as the milkweed bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Joyce here. I have one a, um, a question. Um, let's see. The other day, walking uh, on the window outside, I thought uh, there was a kissing bug. Oh, which is yeah. horrible because they carry yeah. disease. Um, but now I'm thinking maybe it was a what is it? A conifer seed bug because the hind legs were widened. I have a picture of it on my phone. Are you talking about the um, the tibia of the um, of the um, rear legs being yeah. widened into sort of a leaf shape? Yeah. Let me let's see. I have it on the phone. I wonder if I could show it to you. Let's see. Wait. Maybe um, you could stop sharing. Oh boy, I'm getting cursed. Can you see that? You stop share. You want us to stop sharing? Oh, um, you might here to see. I can see it, sort of. Closer or further? Did you did you get a good look at the antennae? <laughs> there they are. Can you see it? I, I can't tell from that photograph, but are the tips of the antennae yellow or orange by any chance? It looks like it. Well, not the tips, sort of in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, well. It's a leaf bug. It's probably uh, one of the, what we call the squash bugs. It was really big. It's like an inch. Yeah, it doesn't look like a kissing bug. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's no, good. I don't think that's a kissing bug. No, but it looks okay. like it's in the squash bug group. Yeah. Right. So you can let that kiss you. It's not a problem. Oh, good. I'll bring it in the house. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okie dokie. <clears throat> well, that, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Did anyone else take the quiz? The insect quiz? Nobody? Oh, that's a big disappointment. <laughs> only, only Mike Newland did? Well, congratulations, Mike. You win. <laughs> you win. <laughs>